Friends Changing the Story, Climate Crisis as a Crisis of Imagination. Uh, this conference is organized by EIT's Climate Knowledge and Innovation Community um, and by the School of Ecopoetics at the Institute of Reportage uh, in Warsaw, Poland. Um, I would also like to encourage you to share this event on your social media, um, on Facebook, on Twitter, invite people uh, to join us for this panel or the next panel that's going to uh, take place immediately after this one. Uh, so our first panel uh, is in response to Grzegorz Czemiel's lecture, uh, Why Science Needs Art. And let me introduce myself briefly and the panelists. Uh, my name is Marta Verbanowska and I am currently a postdoctoral um, assistant at the University of Vienna at the Department of English. Um, uh, my research interests are in Black Studies, Environmental Humanities, and Contemporary Poetry. Uh, and I'm finishing a book on poetry as a way of knowing, so I'm very excited for this panel. And our participants are Julia Fedorczuk, uh, from Poland, who is a poet, writer, translator, researcher, um, who's an expert on eco-criticism and eco-poetics. Uh, she holds an academic post at the Institute of English Studies at the University of Warsaw. Uh, her first poetry collection, Listopad nad Narwią, um, was awarded the Polish Association of Book Publishers Prize. And she's also a recipient of the Hubert Burda Award in Austria and the Szymborska Prize for her volume, Salme. Uh, she's a co-founder with Felix Springer of the School of Ecopoetics and a columnist for Przekrój and Polityka, to, um, uh, Politica being the most popular Polish weekly. And her last novel was published in 2020. It's titled Pod Słońcem. Her work has been translated into over 20 languages. Uh, Piotr Skubała is a professor of biological sciences. He has a PhD from the Faculty of Natural Sciences at the University of Silesia in Katowice. He is a soil ecologist, acarologist, which means that he is dealing with the ecology of Oribatida soil mites. Am I reading this right? Um, and he's an environmental philosopher, educator, climate activist, and an ethics expert for the European Commission in Brussels. He's a member of the GMO and GMM Commission working under the Ministry of the Environment, uh, a contributor to monthly magazines Aura, Ochrona Środowiska and Dzikie Życie, co-organizer of environmental culture festival named Zielonomi, uh, organizer and co-host of meetings held by the Environmental Thought Club and the Interdisciplinary Research Center for Humanities Education at the University of Silesia recently has awarded him with the coveted title of the greatest humanist among natural scientists. Uh, and George Marshall uh, from uh, United Kingdom is the founder of the Climate Outreach and Information Network. He has over three decades experience at all levels of communications and advocacy from community level protest movements to senior positions in Greenpeace and the Rainforest Foundation to advisory roles for governments, businesses and international agencies. He is an award winning documentary maker and writes regularly on climate change issues, including articles for The Guardian, The New Statesman, New Scientist and The Ecologist. And he is also the author of Don't Even Think About It, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Ignore Climate Change, um, a book that's been published in 2014 by Bloomsbury. And as I've just learned, it's about to have its translation into Czech pretty soon. Uh, so a warm welcome to all of our panelists. And um, I hope you won't mind if uh, I'll repeat what Grzegorz did for his lecture and open with a poem, a very short one, um, a poem by Jane Hirschfield. When his ship first came to Australia, Cook wrote, the natives continued fishing without looking up, unable, it seems, to fear what was too large to be comprehended. And the title of the poem is 
climate change. And I think this connection that Hirschfeld makes in this poem uh, between not only the history of colonialism and the history of, of global warming and climate change, but also this connection between something very urgent and threatening happening and the people who are about to be affected by it being not only oblivious, but unable to imagine the almost cosmic horror of this thing happening um, is, is exactly the kind of problem that we are facing today. Um, the inability to process um, the scale and the urgency of what's going on. And this is where both Grzegorz's lecture and, and George's call in his book kind of make a similar um, call for addressing this unthinkability. And I would like to ask all of you, uh, what personal and professional experiences uh, would you like to share with us today about how you have um, tapped into the synergies of sciences, arts, humanities to address this urgency and to make the unthinkable thinkable for a more general public? I'm happy to start if you like, Marta. Absolutely. Um, be, be, because the, the point uh, you started with there is also is, is one which is key to my book, which is this one of a psychology of climate change. And one of the things is in, in cognitive psychology that you have different, there are different processing systems within the brain, built into actually the architecture of the brain, but manage uh, rational, we could say rational decision-making processes um, that's sort of the, the, the more mathematical and structured way of thinking. Um, and we have processes which, which would be called affective reasoning, which is the more emotional and story-driven ways of thinking. And the two are constantly in, in, in conversation, but the important thing is it's that second one, the affective system, that is most powerful. And so it's possible for us, as, as, as the poem is saying, to, to kind of know something and not know something, mm. to kind of understand it in a way, but not really accept it. And for a long time, it's changing a little now, but for a long time, the situation on climate change was that if you ask people, what do you think about climate change or are you concerned about climate change? People would actually know uh, quite a lot and they would tell you about it and they'd say, yes, I'm, I'm concerned mm. about this. But then you, if you ask them, tell me about the things you're really concerned about or the things which are important to you. Nobody would mention climate change. And it was this separation. And I guess, I guess the, for a long time, scientists um, argued that what people needed was more information. So the model of working was of saying, let's give people more information or let's find different ways of communicating the science information. And that is simply not the way that our brains work. What our brains need is narrative, um, this is where the arts come in. We have to find ways of speaking to that, that creative language story part of our brain. Um, and also, this is very important, we need to be hearing things from our, from our friends and the people within our social groups. So the, one of the things I would open up for the conversation is it's not just the, the medium, but it's the messenger. It's who are we hearing this from? And, um, that is a challenge to arts because often arts are very clever with the medium, but not so clever with the messenger. In other words, in other words, if we're reaching wide society, um, writing a climate change opera is not going to work very well for mobilizing all of society, although it might mobilize opera fans. However, having a football team that ha takes strong climate action and talks about it and, and shares what they're doing might. So there are lots of different ways of approaching this. The important thing is we find a way that speaks creatively, but also speaks through messengers who are trusted. Yulia? If I can manage to unmute myself, uh, if I could continue this 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 thought. Uh, well, uh, answering your initial question as to my own practice, uh, 
I am a teacher mostly. I am a teacher of literature. This is what I do most of my life. And uh, so my experience is, is that of introducing environmental issues into literature classes. And this is, uh, this is already a way in which, I mean, this attempt is in itself uh, an attempt to combine uh, uh, humanities and uh, and uh, elements of, of 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 scientific knowledge, but just as George said a minute ago, uh, it it has to do with uh, um, it has to do also with uh, with the context in which this 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 knowledge is appearing, and for 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 some reason when this knowledge about climate change, right? And the conversation about climate change appears in a literature class. I find that this does have an impact on the students who obviously all know that climate change is happening, but they are really surprised that this is something that we can talk about in a class on poetry or in a class on literature, right? And then going from there to realize that no conversation today it's happening outside of the conversation about climate change. Something happened to George? Or, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, because I think I think that this is it's crucial for us to to have this awareness that no conversation nowadays is happening outside of this conversation about uh, climate change and related planetary crisis. Right. Every conversation we're having is a conversation about that. Right. So to make it real somehow, to make this true, this truth real, um, I do begin each of my courses with addressing this question of climate change, because like in this famous title of, of, of Naomi Klein, I do believe that it changes everything. It also changes everything when it comes to how we teach, when we when it comes to how we think about knowledge and how we read literature, how we think about literature and so and so on and so forth. So my experience primarily is that of a teacher who introduces who introduces this topic as a topic which is not you know just one of the classes will be devoted to climate change but as this meta topic which is like whatever we're discussing we're also this we're also thinking 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 about this and also the kind of um the kind of work or the kind of literature that i tend to discuss recently in my classes so the newest poetry 21st century poetry um is very often um uh, you know, the kind of work that does address uh, climate change and other environmental issues explicitly. And it's often a kind of work that uses um, methodology, which is inspired by the sciences. So, for example, you know, all this new trend in poetry to use um, research, right? research based poetry, which is a big thing now. Uh, quite recently there's been quite a few books which are based on research that uses actually scientific methods and so that's another interesting thing in which these themes and ways of knowing uh, can be can be combined in a, in a literature class and i do find that this is effective i mean not on a large scale because of course uh, because of course of course uh, the, the the number of students is limited yes but i do think that education here is important and i also do think that we need a lot of different kinds of interventions so a football team is fine an opera is also fine you know a literature class is also like we need like all hands on board basically yes so wherever we are whatever whatever our impact is i think it's important to combine these uh, possibilities Okay, my turn, yeah? Yes, Piotr, if you would Thank like you. to add something. Uh, when, when I heard about the, the subject of this conference and then and this, this panel especially, to which I was invited, I was overjoyed and partly, partly surprised. I didn't think that I would uh, live in time when we would speak loud about uh, things so important for me which I really feel deeply, for which I did not uh, often find understanding uh, in scientific community, at least in my discipline of biological science, the necessity of cooperation between biological science and humanities art is something obvious for me for many years and necessary for, for me. In my uh, scientific uh, education activities, 
when I popularize science, for example, I have always tried to combine science and uh, and humanities and and art. I often uh, incorporate elements of art, music, uh, poetry, even dance in my scientific lecture, in my scientific workshops, uh, workshops, let's say. And uh, I must say that it works. Sci especially when we think about climate change, uh, environmental crisis, science does not work. Art, poetry, songs, humanities uh, thinking remains in this, in this situation. In this example, climate change, we see the power of literature, of poetry. Uh, by combining uh, science and art, we have a chance, only in this way, we have a chance to convince the audience of the content we want to convey them. Only together, science and art are able to change our behavior. Maybe I, I, I will present you a, a kind of, uh, of my um, type of working. I begin with science, yeah, science with a uh, bigger letter, as Gregor Champion says, pure science, science, uh, uh, singular science with a big letter. Uh, I present the lecture on, on the ecology, on the uh, functioning of the life on the earth. So pure science ecological lecture. I can say I can uh, Mm, finish uh, this lecture with, uh, for example, mm, uh, opinion from the textbook on general ecology by Professor Januar Weiden from Jagiellonia New University. I quote, mutually beneficial relationships of close symbiosis between two or more species are enormously widespread. They permit modern ecosystems and their existence has a significant impact on the formation of uh, species diversity in the bio biosphere. So the first step, science, pure science. Then I put uh, sciences with small letter, humanities, let's say. I, in this way, I reinforce the message about the functioning of life, about the mystery of, uh, of the nature of the life on the uh, on the earth and for example are recalling the opinion of uh, lynn margulis american evolutionary theorist biologist and dorian sagan writer philosopher from the book uh, microcosmos four billion years of evolution from our microbial ancestor uh, i quote uh, life on earth did not develop as uh, as a result of struggle, but mutual help. And then, when I see that uh, that uh, the audience, some students, still do, does not understand, does not feel the deepest truth about the world around us, about the nature, about the functioning of, of biosphere, I said, the only way is uh, to use uh, poetry, song. Only poetry, song, art remains. And I propose to, um, for example, to sing a song. To sing a song. For example, one of one of my favorite songs is Tall Trees. Tall Trees, warm. I will not, I'm not going to, to sing, but I <laughs> right. Tall trees, warm fires, strong winds, deep water. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my soul. Or oh, one of my favorite Polish songs. The title is uh, um, Song of Unity. We are of one earth. We are of one blood. We are of one water. We are of one tear. We are one fire. We are one dream. We are one body, we are one day. Uh, and I must say, it, it works. Pure science, only uh, scientific data without uh, 
emotions without uh, humanity, uh, song, poetry or dance. Uh, there is no chance to, um, to change the world to, to stop the uh, climate crisis. So uh, I'm really happy that we uh, talk about this because there's no future if we still uh, work and um, work uh, separately. Science with big letter and sciences with small letter. Thank you all for, for sharing your responses. And I think um, this example with which uh, Piotr uh, concluded, uh, it actually harks back to what George was saying about this kind of medium is one thing, the messenger is, is another. Uh, because of course, in a classroom setting, you know, Piotr or Julia, you remain like, you know, professors, right? It's, uh, but the, the form of knowledge that you bring in, popular culture, folk, vernacular, um, appeals in a different way as a different knowledge um, in, in a way in which this kind of elite knowledge production of, of science, you know, somewhere up there in the ivory tower may not um and uh, i would like us to i would like to to ask you uh, if you think or how do you think those kind of different types of messengers meaning from vernacular knowledge um, poetic knowledge scientific knowledge how they can be effectively combined to create this planetary vision or if you agree that this kind of planetary vision that Grzegorz is talking about uh, in his lecture, is is this one of those key things for for our climate imagination that we need now? And how can we create it in a way that's not totalitarian, but based on symbiosis, relationality? Mm. I can start this time if it's if it's if it's okay. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because one thing which I think emerges out of what we said in response to your first question is that knowledge is not uh, the same as information. It, like knowledge does not come down, does not cannot be cannot be reduced to just information. Because we know we have a lot of information, we know we have probably too much information from various sources. But knowledge is something else, right? And knowledge has this affective level. It it has. Uh, Perhaps a bodily level, yes. It uh, it is about experience. It is about having taken something to heart. It is perhaps about values also. Okay, so um, so I think this is perhaps an obvious thing, but I think it's worth articulating that when we speak about this conversation between. Um, between the so-called hard sciences and the, the the kind of information that science gives us and the kind of understanding that science gives us and and the arts we're speaking about building a more complete way of knowing yes or a more multiple um, way of knowing that involves information that involves experience that involves values that involves emotions that involves um, uh, ethics perhaps right that involves having taken something to heart having thought about something having lived something um so uh so yeah so i think this is clear to 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 all of us and that clearly emerges out of what we have what we have already said um i think that um this uh, planetary vision or working towards this planetary vision requires a very, very profound revolution in education. I think it requires a very profound change in how we create knowledge. So education is, for me, perhaps because I come from this background, education for me is fundamental. I do believe that it's very, very important to work towards transdisciplinary approaches to work to work towards interdisciplinary uh, approaches this is one of the ambitions of the school of ecopoetics uh, by the way right one of our aspirations is to create 
a kind of space where we can work towards this very, very radically transdisciplinary kind of knowledge. And another aspect of this change or another aspect of this, of this revolution in education is how we build knowledge in terms of making it more like involving more active participation of the students because i also think that this sort of model of knowledge transmission where you stand in front of the classroom and you teach to people and you just give them you know you give them more information that this is completely obsolete yes that it's not working anymore uh, so how we create knowledge how we make this knowledge that will uh, constitute the grounds for this planetary awareness for this planetary uh, vision, yes, uh, this, this also needs to be rethought. So transdisciplinarity is one thing, but another thing is ways of teaching or ways of transmitting or ways of creating or ways of collaborating on knowledge production. And I also think from the other side that the way in which we make art also needs to change. Because, for instance, you know, when it comes, for instance, when it's when it comes to when it comes to poetry, I don't think the traditional model of lyric poetry, which is about self-expression, is very adequate, right? And a lot of people feel this, yes, that the the way in which we make art also requires a different sort of contact with a different sort of engagement, a different sort of showing up for experience than uh traditionally let's say yes so i would say that uh that changes are needed on all of these levels and we have to think about all of these levels simulta simultaneously for me education is crucial right and and changes in education in education are crucial on all level of education if we are to to work towards these these planetary visions i think there is i think a lot of work needs to be done i think we are at the very beginning it's wonderful that we're having this conversation and that this conversation is happening not just here it's happening all over the place everybody's saying this so like everybody's saying now we need to have this dialogue between arts and sciences we need to change the way we know things uh but i think we are at the very beginning of uh of this of this journey towards actually you know working out the the, the methods of che of teaching and 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 the forms of collaboration they already begin to emerge but these forms of collaboration i i, I think they need to be worked out thank you julia mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, it, it will be interesting example for for you of cooperation between uh, science ecology in my example and uh, sciences humanities art uh, interesting example of this uh, as you julia said transdisciplinarity uh, in a 20 uh, in 2004 i, I had a lecture on uh, on uh, the title was living on the symbiotic planet a comet against uh, nature red in tooth and claw it was on the international conference, the title Towards a New uh, Renaissance, Human Values, Spirituality and the Future. Uh, it was at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. One of the conference participants was Professor Marek Oziewicz. Professor Marek Oziewicz is now at the University of Minnesota in the uh, United States. He's a literary scholar in the field of American literature and culture. Probably uh, he listened to our conversation now <laughs> from, from uh, USA. One, one year later, he invited me to give a lecture at the international conference. It was in, in uh, Wroclaw. The title of this conference, Towards or Back to Human Values, Spiritual and Moral Dimensions of Contemporary Fantasy. Uh, the, so I have a lecture on ecology, about the mystery of life on, on the Earth, about the functioning of our planet. Uh, and I, uh, this lecture was to the representative of fantasy uh, literature all over the world. So for me, um, uh, strange, <laughs> uh, 
fantastic uh, experience to speak to the representative of fantasy literature about the, uh, about the secret of the functioning of life. Later, uh, Professor Marek Ozievich uh, revealed uh, why he invited me to this conference, especially. And uh, he, uh, he explained me that uh, when he listened to my lecture in Krakow, he was surprised because he know from the literature this uh, vision of the world. You know that uh, life is uh, unity, that every um, species is connected, that every species is important, that uh, mutual help is the, the most important uh, uh, item in the functioning of, of life on the earth and so on. Uh, so uh, the vision of life, which is really uh, optimistic, uh, the vision of the life uh, of the symbiosis on this planet. He uh, thought that uh, this kind of vision is only in the literature, that uh, the world the, the nature uh, is different, you know, cruel and so on. And it appears that uh, ecology explains this in this way, that, that the, the most important thing is symbiosis, mutual help, and the nature is uh, really friendly. Uh, so I think it's... Uh, good example uh, of, co of cooperation between uh, science, ecology in this example, and uh, literature or, or art. We even have uh, one uh, chapter in, in, in one book in, in published in, in Cambridge. Uh, the title is Do We Live on the Symbiotic Planet? Ecological Principles of Life on Earth and the Literary Implication. So in my life, uh, you know, contact, uh, experience with uh, uh, scientists from, from human, hum, humanity disciplines are really important. Uh, and I hope that uh, the future belongs to the, mm, yeah, is, uh, I see that the future in cooperation between uh, scientists, which uh, give solution, and humanities, which can implement this solution in our imagination. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. George, would you like to add something? Yeah, I um, I, w I wanted to, to come to something I think that you were saying, Marta, this word elite. Um, I, I think we need to be very careful of saying what what do we what do we need to say and who do we need to speak to. Um, climate change poetry is not going to get us far towards building uh, a public mandate for climate action. Um, I I like poetry. I have friends who are poets, but this is we need to recognise that, that the need is to reach people. And therefore, the question is, what is the best way of reaching people? That's the important thing. The need is not to mobilize the arts. Um, the need is to find a way that the arts can reach people to mobilize them. And I think that is the priority. So the question I always ask is, is this a good way of reaching people? Does it speak to them in a way which, which uh, uh, speaks to their their emotional narrative sense and um are they are we reaching the right people because part of the issue for uh for our own societies is that we have a very wide distribution of attitudes to climate change um all societies are to some degree polarized on climate change Obviously, some more than others, North America very much, but uh, Poland has a political polarization on climate change, for example. Uh, uh, my own country, Britain, has a polarization. Uh, people who are right-wing are more skeptical than left-wing. 
people who are uh, older are more than younger, uh, men more than women. So if we can imagine, for example, uh, an older an older white uh, man conservative in a rural area, this is the kind of person we really have to be reaching. And so my question is, how do we reach them? And are there arts which reach them? Or are there better ways of reaching them in, in, in some different way? Um, so I've, I've seen a lot of uh, really interesting work done on combining the arts with the sciences and doing very, very innovative and interesting work. And, and I welcome that. I think, again, I, uh, I think as we were hearing before from Julia, I think, you know, um, um, the, the, the more the better. All, all of the above, but where the absolute priority has to be, I think, is in finding ways of reaching the people who are currently at the edge of a conversation. And that can also include the arts, but the kind of arts which speak to them are not going to be elite arts, I would suggest. Uh, it might be things, for example, like uh, uh, popular music. Uh, it might be through the medium of um, soap opera, for example, and, uh, you know, of uh, television drama. Um, here in Britain, by the way, we've had a very interesting uh, initiative to, to bring climate change into this kind of mainstream television material. So uh, we have in Britain, soap operas are very, very big. Uh, we, have, uh, we have maybe four major ones which are watched by more than half the population. Um, and it's been very clever just bringing these in as a theme without making it into a lecture. And I think this is how we, this is how we build support for climate change, but it's something which is in people's lives around them, not something that they are making an effort to listen to, but it becomes part of their, part of their cultural environment. So I guess the thing which I'm saying on here is let's think very broadly by how we define art and let's make sure that the priority is that it is about reaching people to galvanize them into action and support. That, that for me, is the is the absolute priority? Oh, and I should finally say this point about this point about having a uh, a, a shared vision. Um, yes, I think we need to have a shared sense that this is a major threat we need to mobilise around. But I think it's healthy for us to have very different ideas about what we do and how we respond to it. Uh, we don't all have to agree about the world and how we think the world is and how we want uh, and the changes we want to make. Um, I think there's a very strong tendency, particularly of uh, climate change advocates from the left wing, to say we want climate change to talk about social justice and to talk about um, you know much wider issues of of fighting for equality in society. That's fine. They should say that, of course, and I agree with many of those ideas. But what I should say is that also alienates people who are more conservative. So I think it's healthy for us to have very different ideas about what we think the vision is and where we want to go. We have a meta-narrative, which is we have a problem, but we face this. We have this in common. We are all members of our country, of our society, of humanity. We all share this so much in common, and we have to come together on this. And we all have something to contribute. That's the main one. Then within that, we may have very different ways of talking. And I think it's healthy if there is friction between those. And actually, if we talk about the arts, I think it's healthy if within the arts, there are very different ways of talking about climate change. We really don't want to, I really don't want to see a single way of talking. Oh, no, if I can add bottom, uh, no, no, that would be the end of arts. I mean, if we, you know, if we created, if we created sort of like a standard way of speaking or standard, a standard story that everybody has to adhere to, that would be the end of, of arts. Uh, I think that's the very opposite to what, uh, what, ar what, art, what ar art can do best, uh, which is precisely complicate the conversation, right? Which is pr precisely um, provide a variety of voices. Um, uh, sure, I mean, I agree with what you said about um i kind of almost agree with what you said about um uh, poetry being incapable of reaching a white audience and making change um but i also think that before this conversation like okay for 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 this for a serious conversation about climate to become mainstream, it has to happen somehow, right? And so one step is to start talking about it and to stop pretending that it's not happening. So for example, for myself, 
I am a scholar of literature. I teach literature. That's what I do. That's where I am. And so for me, what this means is that I talk about it in my literature classes. So, I mean, so the, you know, the thing is, let's not pretend that it's not happening. Uh, and then, okay, sure, you know, the kind of work that we discuss in class is probably not going to, it's probably not very useful for, I don't know, banners, you know, people will not carry it uh, uh, to demonstrations, yes? But this is how it becomes part of everyday thinking. This is how it becomes part of everyday conversations. And then you never know who that person talks to next. Yes, maybe it's the guy that you want to reach. I don't know. Then people say also uh, there's been there's been um, there's been research which suggests that climate deniers are really quite few by this stage, and that it's more effective for climate action to actually ignore them completely because they are probably not going to be persuaded into caring. But what's more important or what's more urgent is to sort of take care of the people who are quite aware that climate change is happening, but they feel overwhelmed, they feel helpless, they feel a kind of marasmus, yes? They feel that, you know, there's nothing we can do. The only thing that comes to our mind is the apocalypse. So this is, I think, also another really important area where arts can help, just to help people overcome depression, to help people overcome the sense of helplessness, to overcome, you know, the lack of imagination, the lack of vision of, of, of a future that would be would be different than apocalyptic. So all these all these various all these various um, various ways I think in which uh, in which art can be can be helpful here. Uh, and then I think, uh, yeah, I mean the crucial thing is to make this conversation sort of mainstream enough. So that at some point the soap soap opera, you know, or whatever this really popular you know it will be it will only come as a natural consequence that's that's um that this conversation will also enter these really super popular these really super popular uh media i i just wanted to say i i um no i of course i agree with you uh julia that um and 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 you know it is entirely good to be talking about this in uh in a tutorial group or in a lecture or in a university this is very important. Um, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just saying let's let's remember the broad picture. But I would say that you have talked many times about starting the conversation, and that's another thing that I think that the arts can contribute, which is very very important. It is about enabling a conversation, which then happens between people, and if if the arts can initiate that conversation, that is very powerful because actually. Um, again, going back, as it were, to the psychology, we know that we know that um, the way that people's attitudes form are usually through interactions with the people around them. And you you look and you see that is important to that person there, that person there, that person there. These are the people around you, and therefore it starts to become important to you. That's how you would make it salient, is the the word psychologists would use. And that social salience is so important. So it's got to be fed into people in a way. So again, I think it's a challenge for the arts of not just how to reach people, but also how to initiate a conversation which lasts outside the art itself. So it's not just like a kind of, you don't just consume something and then walk away, but it's something that triggers you to speak and to talk wider. And I would say, I think that we've seen very big social changes over certainly over my lifetime uh, certainly around attitudes to gender, to race, to uh, sexuality. A key factor in those changes has been the conversations which has happened between friends and, and family and people at work. You know, that, that is so important. Or let's say smoking. Um, you know, the thing that's now made it not acceptable for people to smoke and what we're seeing smoking rates decline is that it's now not socially acceptable. And there's been a whole series of these billions of these little conversations. And that's where change happens. Yes. Uh, I would like to, to refer to, to one of the most important parts uh, of the lecture by, by Grzegorz Czemiel, and Julia also mentioned uh, this. Uh, I mean, uh, building uh, of a vision of the world as a whole. Uh, Grzegorz Czemiel uh, talked about a model of the earth that engages our imagination. 
we need a vision a vision uh, that can lead uh, to a model that guarantees a workable and sustainable way of life uh, Grzegorz uh, talk a lot about world building uh, he mentions that this world building is composed of two uh, parts science and storytelling uh, and as uh, Julia said, we need uh, a vision. We live in a dark time, dark t times. We, uh, a lot of people fall into a climate depression now. When they think about climate crisis, we uh, think about uh, the apocalypse. I myself uh, may say that uh, I'm also put a lot of effort into not giving up now. The, the prospects are dark and mankind's future is bound to be dark, not bright. So especially we need uh, a vision of a better future. And this is a role for, not for science, science gives solution, but uh, art, literature can give this uh, uh, imagination of a better future. Professor uh, Marek Oziewicz, which I already mentioned, he uses the term planetarianism. I like this, this very much. Planetarianism means, uh, uh, planetarianism describe a vision of a real better tomorrow for the whole world, which can be expressed primarily in stories. Creating such a vision is a major challenge for, for today's culture, as uh, Marek Oziewicz said. Uh, Marek Oziewicz says, uh, I'm deeply convinced, I quote now, I'm deeply convinced that the struggle for a vision of the future for us and the Earth is not a technological, political or economic problem, at least not in the first place. First of all, it is a matter of imagination. We need to be able to envision a future based on hope. I believe, Julia, that you like this because you many times mentioned that the ecological crisis is the crisis of our imagination. Uh, I recently have a great pleasure to um, practice this uh, kind of building uh, a vision of a better world with the uh, youth during the youth climate strike on November this year in Katowice. And I invited, I invited young people to imagine the world 2050, the world, the, the world we must create. I was invoking uh, one of the vision of the optimistic uh, changes that uh, had taken place in the world 2050. And uh, after each of them, I asked them for the uh, applause. The greater the applause, the more, uh, the more desire one uh, dream uh, was by majority. Uh, I consider important in this way, in this way, I mm, would like to show uh, young people that the, the world we, can, we must uh, build is uh, optimistic, in, is really nice, is really fantastic. I would like to present them uh, in what, uh, what, what is the beautiful task before them and what a beautiful time to live now in this dark times, but it's really beautiful. Douglas Bowman, writer, said, I quote, what a wonderful time to live. Humanity is rediscovering its sources in its uh, consciousness, the nature of life, the, the world, the universe, God. We stand on the threshold of new time for Earth because we are faced today with the possibility of taking a new evolutionary step. We are faced with the challenge of entering a new life with a new way of thinking. And uh, the experience uh, 
of uh, this kind of world building with uh, teenagers, with uh, uh, youth in, in Katowice, for me it was really was really great, and I think we really need to uh, to present, especially uh, young people, the optimistic, beautiful vision of the world, because this world which uh, adults build are awful, but uh, before them is really a beautiful time. So what a wonderful time to live now. Since you mentioned my name, I will allow myself to, to, to respond. It's wonderful what you're saying. Um, I also think that um, uh, yeah, I do think that this positive vision is is uh, is needed. Uh, however, I also think that the gravity of the situation, like I mean, the gravity of the situation right now, needs to be acknowledged, and the fact that very profound structural changes, like in basically every realm of human life, every system, right, economy, you know, the way we get our food the way we try like everything needs to be transformed so so the first so for me the first step is to is is to address the gravity of the situation right and to even allow ourselves this uh, moment of uh, maybe not depression but this moment of grief as someone put it beautifully uh here in the in the chat uh because this grief is very real and uh and i think part of part of the reason why this conversation is so difficult to have about climate change is because we repress the grief, uh, you know, that is that is that is a very real experience. However, start like starting from this, from this moment of 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 acknowledging how 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 grave the situation is, and from going through this grief, I I, I do believe that it's crucial to to uh, to create these uh, these um, vision of alternative futures alternative to the apocalypse because this crisis of the imagination that we we keep it's not these are not my words it's a quote from Lawrence Buell uh, but we keep repeating this and I think primarily what this means is that people think either you know people are so attached to our way of life right now it just it feels so inevitable it feels so naturalized you know the way we live the way we use the planet i mean we i say we of course the we is problematic because not everybody is using the planet in the same way but let's say you know we are here all of us relatively privileged because we're europeans so we are the we actually who use the planet um, and so it just it just feels so it's been so naturalized it's like it feels like nature you know our our ways of of engaging with 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 the earth and so when people think oh so you know so either we have to lose all this or or you know our climate will change like the, the the first reaction is is okay so there's nothing you know no but this will not like we can't a, a change such a profound change is not going to happen. It's not realistic, which means, okay, the world is going to end because the world is going to get, it's going to, it's, it's going to end. We can just as well live our lives as if nothing was happening. So I think this, this is where I see this crisis of the imagination, this lack of alternative to, to the status quo. And of course, you know, the state, the status quo we know is unsustainable. It's incompatible with the laws of physics. This idea of endless progress is incompatible with the laws of physics on this planet, as we know, right? So to create this beautiful vision, as you say, you know, the fact that this that this that these new ways of engaging with uh, with the earth, that they can be full of joy. And that even this moment can be full of joy when we make, when we form. Uh, communities of support when we start all kinds of activist actions that these moments can also be full of joy i think i agree with you that it's very very important and part of the reason why we have organized the school of eco poetics is because we wanted more joy you know in our work and we have found more joy in friendship in you know in building a network in you know in meeting with you guys even today like all this working together building this collective sense of agency is 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 psychologically i think very important and once again maybe it's happening on a small scale but when 
thousands of such initiatives are happening on a small scale. I just really think it's 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 important to keep sort of adding energy to this good conversation, yes, inventing this alternative future without repressing the gravity of the situation, you know, how, so, how serious it already is, uh, it already is, and that, and that there probably is going to be, to be suffering also in the, in the future. Thank you, Yulia. And I think, yes, this idea of joy, not necessarily because of something, but in spite of something, joy as, you know, resistance right um uh, bef i'll put my own question on the back burner because we do have a question from the audience um that might relate a little bit to something that emerged out of your discussions here um to me also the question of of uh, language how climate change you know without climate change normally not climate disaster slash catastrophe, right? We talk the global warming that's now maybe less used than climate change, but still like warming does not sound like anything um, bad really. Um, and so um, in other words, although I'm, I'm, I'm worried to put it in those terms, but the question of uh, very much in quotes, marketing of climate change, how we talk about it in general. And the question that we have from the audience um, is related. Um, Mateusz Garica says, businesses also use art in their attempts to attract consum uh, consumers. Advertising is about stories, music, copywriting, and they have a lot of media. Do you have an idea how to connect not only art and science, but also marketers? I assume that in the process of communicating climate change to a broader audience. I wonder if you think that there is poten more potential or more threat. I can uh, I can speak to that because uh, my own organization, Climate Outreach, this is, uh, we are specialists in public communication and engagement. So of course we work with people across the, the communications world. Um, and I'd say, I'd say yes and no, um, there are, there are ways that people in marketing design and develop and test communications, which are very valuable for us. Um, in particular, there is a, a methodology of research, um, identifying different groups within society. So segmenting society and saying, <coughs> pardon me, um, uh, where are the, where are the different attitudinal groups? Where are the values groups, and how do we speak to them in ways which are part of their experience and uh, part of their values? And that's very important because that goes back to the point I was saying before that if we're trying to reach people, we have to do it well. So I think that is valuable. I think, however, there are weaknesses with that. Part of the weakness of the the business model of the advertising model is that it's uh, it's often very one way. It's about saying, here is the message, we want you to have this. And often it's actually about making people feel bad about things, of saying, you know, you need to have this information or you need to have this. Um, and really what we need, as I said, is much more of a conversation which is between people. But of course, and that really is the real weakness of commercial marketing, is that it's about selling things. And it's about selling a product. And that if you're selling a product, uh, like supposing like my phone, um, it doesn't matter if uh, half of people hate it. Because if the other half like it and buy it, that is a huge commercial success. So advertising is not concerned with creating the damage that comes from mis-selling something if it manages to get the if it manages to get the sales. And this has had a very bad effect on climate change communications because a lot of climate communications is asking how do we reach people and how do we move them, but is not asking, hang on, are there people who are actively alienated by this message who are going to move in the other direction? A big concern for my organization has been, that, uh, as I've said before, is that a lot of climate change communications carry a, uh, a politically progressive left wing value set and that people who do not share those values move in the other direction. And we're not talking here, Julia, about climate deniers. I'm talking about people who are a little a little unsure, a little skeptical. They're not there. 
there the number of people who think climate change is not happening is very few you're right but the number of people who think it's been exaggerated that it's in the future uh, that there are other things that are more important now there's a lot of people in that group and actually that's a more dangerous group because that is the group which in the end is going to block climate policy so the lesson maybe uh, is to say uh, this is a product that somehow we have to find a way of selling to everybody and as I said, I think it's a different way of talking and it's a different way. It's more open conversation. Oh, I will also add that in my own work, something I've seen so many times is that governments, you know, governments, governments have a commitment, by the way, to um, engage citizens with climate change. Uh, they have a legal commitment. They, the Paris Agreement had a whole uh, article on this. The original framework convention had Article 6, which was completely on this. So governments have a legal commitment, and that means whatever we're doing, if we're working in activism or if we're working in the arts, we should be saying, governments, you you pay for this. Like, you know, this costs money. If you want things to happen, put some money into it. Um, but what governments typically do is they do nothing, actually. Most governments put no money into this. But when they do, they go, well, let's just bring in an advertising agency. And that is almost always a mess, a disaster. Because the advertising agency will do some like clever little, clever little language, and they'll do some little images, and they'll put it out, and then they'll forget about it. Whereas actually, what we need is something that is less clever and sustained, and goes on and on and on. Right. That's a lot. Of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, George. Would anyone, either of you, would like to engage with this? I'm just. Um, yeah, I just, uh, just sorry, it's maybe just a random thought, but I, but in in the context of what what George said, and these pe the people you know who are, who, who uh, are against transformation, even though they don't deny climate change, maybe here because you know because we keep thinking lately, we keep saying that how you know how we shouldn't, uh, you know how people shouldn't be scared because scaring people is not helpful and how it's so hard to imagine climate change because it's so vast. But on the, on the other hand, it becomes easier and easier to imagine climate change because it's becoming, you know, because the, the, the uh, uh, symptoms are so drastic yes already recent summers and 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 various uh, various uh, natural catastrophes that have been happening and 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 uh, weather extremes that have been happening all over the planet from what i know uh the scientific community is changing the way in which these individual weather events are attributed to climate change because not long ago it was impossible to say that this particular hurricane is caused by climate change because you always needed to say yes in principle climate change is going to whatever uh, uh, like increase the number of hurricanes however in this particular case we cannot say that it was caused by climate change i think this is going to change now that this 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 method of attribution or or the way in which this attribution is articulated is going to change so that it is actually possible to say that with according to all likelihood this was caused by by climate change so so i mean to, to like somehow getting this across it's 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 a difficult task to get across the gravity of the situation you know without making people paralyzed but i do think and i i here here i am i am actually repeating what um uh, what what uh, Magdalena Butyshevska is saying, uh, one of our teachers at the School of Ecopoetics, who is a psychologist at Warsaw University, she says she emphasizes this sort of more, you know, more serious aspect or more 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 even depressing aspect of climate change that we we do need to articulate how serious it is so that so that it it does get across you know that it's actually it is a, a an existential threat to civilization yes because this does not register i don't think yes that it is actually it does pose an existential threat to our civilization and in this context uh, worrying about how much it's going to cost, for instance, it's or, or like how much uh, mitigation is going to cost. It's kind of really, 
you know, ridiculous because uh, the other alternative is is the non-existence of the civilization, maybe yes, or, or so. Uh, so sorry, I, like I have nothing ready to say. I just thought, in response to what George was saying, that that uh, that uh, m maybe we have recently uh, underscored optimist maybe a bit too much. I don't know, uh, and. Uh, uh, and this also somehow, but how to commun how to co how to communicate how to communicate this? I don't know. I don't think you can have advertising for, mm. you know. I don't think either advertising could work. You know, I can think about sort of like really mainstream promotion of these alternative visions of the future mm. that would be that could perhaps become fashionable, that could perhaps become hip. Returning to what George earlier said about you know, very popular culture promoting uh, ecological attitudes. Although the problem with popular culture is also that it's very commercial. So it usually also, you know, oh. sells something. So I don't know, sorry, but maybe it didn't make any sense what I tried to say, but... Uh... I, I had a quick return if I could, but uh, is, is that okay, Peter? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to say this question about how we communicate how the existential threat um, it's the, the the research for a long time was saying you can't tell people um, uh, bad you know uh, depressing messaging uh, you know um, and that's wrong I think um, but I think you have to do it in a way that validates and supports their sense of identity so a lot mm -hmm. of what we know about communications is that people people have an identity that that is something that makes them proud. We have to find a way of speaking to that in a way that reinforces their identity. And so the messaging, we've tested messaging all around the world. And it's interesting that one of the things we test, which comes through again and again, is a comparison between saying there are many easy things we can do on this. Uh, we can come together. We can deal with this problem, like kind of a positive message or a more challenging message. And the more challenging message is the one which always works best with any audience, left wing, right wing. We've tested this in India, across North Africa, Canada. And the message is to say, this will be hard. This is going to be really hard, but we can do it because we faced problems before. Mm. We faced, and in every culture, people have faced problems. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking to you guys from Poland. Crikey, you have had such a hard history. But you can say, we have faced those problems. We have come through proud strong we have come through we are independent we are moving forwards and this is another problem but we've shown that we can do it so it's a way of it's not a positive message it's making people feel positive about their identity in the context of something that is challenging and of course the beauty of this kind of message is it speaks well across the political bar barriers as well because it's about a sense of national identity that is not the same as nationalism it's a kind of community cultural pride, not we are better than you, but of saying, yeah, of saying we can do this. And this, this is, I promise, is the last thing I'm saying, because the same goes for groups of people, such as coal miners, for instance, yes, or groups of people whose livelihood and whose family traditions have been uh, <coughs> uh, closely linked with uh, extraction economies. Absolutely, uh, um, you know that their yeah. pride in also needs to be respected. Yes, and that they, they, that their their sense of identity also needs to be respected. And and, and, and uh, thank you for asking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went to Katowice for the uh, for the um, for the COP conference. Uh, I met the uh, the former head of a Polish. Um, uh, miners, coal miners trades union. My own family are coal miners for four generations, up to my grandfather. Um, and I feel very strongly that we need to respect and recognize and, and, and the contribution that, uh, that fossil fuels have made. And we need to say to people, this is not going to be easy, but we're going to support you and help you with this transition. There is still a lot of contributions that you can make. In Alberta, we did a big program in Alberta and Canada where everybody is invested in the oil industry, either themselves or their friends or their families. And the language which works there starts by saying, thank you. Thank you for the thank you for the work and the contribution you have made to our country and our prosperity. We now know that we need to move towards new resources. 
but we are a resource economy and your skill can help to carry us through to these new resources. This is not going to be easy. This is going to be difficult. This is going to be challenging when we face these problems before. It's that message. But you're absolutely right, Julie. We have to start by recognizing the, and respecting these communities. And my colleagues in the environmental movement, as you heard from Marta, I've worked all of my life. I've worked for Greenpeace, for many grassroots organizations. We fundamentally dis, um, disrespect some of these people who we need to be working with. Yes. Um, George, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I agree with you totally, but I'm not going to talk about the Polish situation because it's sad for me situation in, in Poland and uh, the way of thinking of uh, miners and other, other people. Uh, I think that uh, there is a possible scenario that we as a humanity will behave like people on the Titanic. Yeah, uh, they, they, they know everything, they, they, they see that they sank, but they do the same. And th the same could be with with us, the, the only solution for me is to change our way of thinking, total change of our way of thinking about ourselves and uh, the nature, our planet. So, in, uh, in my opinion, there's the, the main task for science and the main task for poetry is to question or undermine anthropocentrism. It's the fundamental for, 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 for me. If we will not uh, change uh, the way of thinking of people, if we will not uh, challenging anthropocentrism, there, there's no future for us. But science, for example, ecology, as a part of biology, uh, in terms of ecological research, the work of nature, our work is biocentric. So in science, we have a great uh, help to show people, to con convince them that uh, the world in reality is biocentric. So uh, in my opinion, that. Our task is to, uh, to present this opinion to, to the audience. It's a very difficult task, yeah, I agree. But uh, we have science, uh, scientific evidences that the world is biocentric. And we have uh, a lot of uh, fantastic people in, in uh, humanities, in, in art. Uh, so uh, the only way is to, to use these uh, tools, science and art, and to uh, convince people that their way of uh, thinking about life, about themselves, is, is simply wrong. Because uh, the word nature is, uh, is even, is uh, biocentric. <laughs> And so, uh, you, when I uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, you you know when I when I mentioned earlier that I think we need a revolution in education towards trans transdisciplinarity. Um, I think part of what I think is important is that, for example, the humanities students or the students of literature also uh, learn some fundamental science. You know because. I, I also think that the kind of speci speci very narrow specialization that we have at universities nowadays is 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 perhaps a bit of a problem that people really know very little. Even you know everybody knows about climate change, but people not really know very little about how it works. And understanding a little bit about how it works, I think, helps to make it more real. I think brings it home, uh, or at least that's how it works for me. You know, the moment I learned a little bit about the physics of of atmosphere that became more real <laughs> so um so you know yeah so i mean just responding to what you said about once again about combining these these ways of knowing or uh, uh, articulating 
finding ways to articulate in language on many levels what science teaches us, I think is, is, is very crucial. And for this reason, I think it's also very crucial that we as humanities scholars turn to science because humanities, uh, you know, I, I speak as a humanities scholar and as a writer myself. Uh, and I and, and I know um, you know we sometimes we have sometimes had tenden ten tendencies to turn to the sciences, but use uh, the scientific theories uh, as metaphors, you know, in ways which are very off, you know, which are not always very precise. And so I think respecting science as as uh, as um, our most reliable source of knowledge is crucial, right? That's another crisis that we're facing that people stopped trusting science. Uh, because that's also how social me media work, that you, you can have scientific consensus on one side and then on the other side, someone has an opinion and these are presented as two equivalent sort of, you know, ways of thinking, yes? So, so these are very fundamental things which I think have to change in education, that people have to be taught what is proper knowledge, what is the knowledge that can be trusted and what is not, yes? And then, uh, yeah, and I think, you know, my own experience as a teacher, uh, when I introduce, like, uh, for example, in my poetry classes, when we sometimes read poems that demand a little bit of botany, uh, people, th the students love it. They really enjoy it. They really enjoy learning a little bit about, you know, because people don't even know the names of trees in their city. And so, um, so once again, you know, it's a small intervention, but, you know, I, I, I'm just hoping that it's going to grow. And, and, I, and I do think that education is important. Of course, it happens slowly, but, you know, unless, you know, unless the world ends pretty soon, uh, this process of transformation is going to take a long time. So we need both, I guess, short term interventions and long-term in interventions through art and education to, 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 to change people's way of, way of thinking. Thank you. Would, would anybody like to engage, um, George or Piotr, what, what Julia was saying? Okay, we have um, less than 10 minutes or about 10 minutes for um, our discussion. Uh, so uh, I would just maybe briefly uh, ask uh, a wrap-up question and uh, ask you for um, uh, for brief kind of wrap-up answers um, through a perspective that I think emerged out of um, what you all have been pointing to as uh, one of the both challenges and avenues for change and something that Grzegorz is briefly mentioning in his talk, um, it's it's the institutional role. Because, um, you know, Julia um, keeps underscoring the role of education, which of course is crucial. Um, but apart from education, um, spirituality, Piotr, I think you mentioned it twice in, in lectures that you were delivering. And, um, you know, I don't want to uh, narrow down education to schools and spirituality to churches, because this is a very, you know, limited vision. Um, but the role of those institutions in those two realms is significant. And those are also two institutions um, that will reach, uh, you know, that person that George was talking about, the, the, the white working class rural man in his 60s, right? Um, well, maybe not school anymore, but, you know, through his grandchildren. Um, so briefly, um, uh, and and I will be interrupting you if need be, um, any comments on this kind of institutional role and hope uh, if those institutions can help merging and synergizing um, art, sciences, humanities? We're very polite, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe, may, maybe then I, 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 if 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 I will start. Um, okay. Yes, I think. Uh, I, well, I think institutions and networks. Um, I think uh, if we go back to the the question I said, which is how do we how do we reach widely? How do we reach across society? How do we build this? How do we build this uh, this broad mandate for action? Then institutions are very important. Education is important because there's so many levels for education. And you're quite right there, Martin, to say, you know, the influence 
is not just on the people who are in the in the education it's on the people around them it's the effect of children's on their families and 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 it, it reaches much much wider then there's other forms of education that are even less formal i think museums are a form of education i think museums are interesting because i think they're in exactly this crossover space between science and arts the presentation of information in a museum is often very artistic and many of the people who work in that have an arts background um, and I actually I, I've worked with many museums on the development of climate change um, content and I think that's I think that's very valuable um, I'd say that uh, institutions broadly uh, uh, yeah I mean spiritual is not just for church but let's just talk about churches um, the the possibility to reach people through faith is very very important and uh i actually have i've worked with uh, i've run programs for some years across uh, across the main faiths and i think the ones which most interest me actually are the muslims and the hindus hinduism has a very strong spirit of uh of um keeping of of the world as a the world being in balance balance is a, is a core concept and how actually humanity has knocked the world out of balance it's very interesting to me doing research work in india but indians automatically accept the idea that it may be us through our actions and our pollution that's changing the world's weather patterns there isn't there isn't any they don't even need the science that's just built into the culture Muslims are very interesting because within Islam there is a very strong sense of not taking too much of moderation again this idea of balance is very very strong in Islam so I think there's so much powerful in there and I'd say if we're talking about institutions let's also talk about the workplace the workplace is a very important you know people spend most of their lives actually uh, you know at, at work uh, they spend many people spend more time with their work colleagues than they do with their family there's a lot that can happen here, both from the employers helping to build a culture and awareness of climate change inside the, the organization, but also with trades unions and with people who actually work directly with workers in the workplace. And let's remember also uh, that, uh, that the workplace also is not just what happens there, but they buy from people, they have a supply line that they can be talking with and they sell to people, they have a, they have a, uh, a you know, they have a customer base. Um, my organization at the moment is working with IKEA, as you can imagine, a more progressive organization at exactly this way of saying, how can we, how can we train members of staff to have conversations with each other and with the wider public as part of their work about climate change? And, and so you see, and I, again, going back, I guess, to the point about the arts, I think all of this is very creative. I don't have a dividing line between arts and science and communications. I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of crossover there, but we need creative ideas about language to come from the arts. But we can include the arts into the way that we present things, um, and that we can uh, we can yeah yeah. Thank you for this um, school um, churches workplace. Also, Julia Piotr, do you have any um, quick additions that you would like to to share? We have a couple more minutes. I just want to say just one thing because uh, the institutional the institutional problem that Grzegorz uh, knows and I know because we bo <laughs> both work as academics is that uh, the academy is of course you know it's a huge like university is a huge institution yes and it has departments and everything and this um, uh, transdisciplinary work is not always easy and also. Um, uh, one one problem uh, that can be diagnosed is um, is the problem that in this neoliberal sort of uh, uh, system of values, humanities are made to conform to uh, a certain system where we have to show up for you know uh, what we've done in ways which are I think incompatible with the best practices in our discipline. So I, I do see an institutional problem, for example, in how humanities function at the university right now. So like the, the, one, 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 one thing is the, um, one thing is the, the institutional obstacle to interdisciplinarity and the other is institutional obstacles to the freedom of, of, of the humanities because we're, you know, we're asked to deliver deliverables. <laughs> yes, and that's, uh, 
you know, everybody who works in the academy knows that this is a problem. So, but I don't know how to solve it. I mean, and we're nearing the end of this panel. So, uh, mm. yes, we are uh, running out of time. Uh, so, um, Piotr, if you could ju just one sentence, couple of sentences, uh, okay. please go ahead. Uh, what is the institution institutional role of uh, university, for example? I can say, tell the truth. Uh, one year later, it was a fantastic article by 17 uh, famous ecologists, and they say that uh, we people, politicians, but also we need cold shower. The rector of my university said that we uh, people, academics, we need cognitive shock. Uh, mm. So we must tell the truth about the world and the, the truth is only one we live in a planetary crisis crisis uh, as regard uh, nature a, a clue for us uh, to exist means to coexist we cannot exist with others other species exist means coexist with others Tell the Thank truth. You. Thank you, Piotr. Um, I think, yes, exist is coexist, right? Um, and, and this is the, the, the shift in the imagination um, that, that we need. Uh, I would like to thank you all um, for participating in this panel. Um, George said to begin with thank you, which is going to be my, my takeaway from this, um, uh, from this one. Mm, to begin a conversation with thank you that's that's so powerful and um let me all close this conversation with thank you to to the panelists uh to Grzegorz for delivering the lecture and to everyone who has tuned in to to listen uh to this conversation i invite you to watch the panel that's going to follow in less than 10 minutes from this one thank you everyone thank you very much mm -hmm.